Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Darshana Mutumuni, and I hope all of you can hear me well, and I hope all of you can see the screen. If there are issues, please uh, send a text. My colleagues are, I won't see your text, but, but there are colleagues who are here with me uh, to help me out. So if there are issues, we will try to do our best, but hopefully the technology works well. These are difficult times, and I hope all of you are keeping safe and working from home. And we have had these type of webinars, technical presentations, uh, a number of times in the past. And given the times, given the situation, we thought this is a good time to have a series of technical presentations. So there will be, as you may have seen, there will be a number of webinars, number of presentations over the next few months on a range of topics. The we will be presenting webinars on specific topics like bre circuit breaker TRV studies, <clears throat> subsynchronous resonance studies, over voltage studies, renewable integration studies, and so on. But today, we thought we will start this off by discussing the very fundamental aspects of electromagnetic transient simulations. Like we do a lot of trainings and presentations and over the past five years we have seen the application seen a very very uh, a significant increase in the application and use of electromagnetic transient studies for power system uh, analysis. This is mostly driven driven by the growing complexity of power systems, like you're trying to operate your system close to the edge, so to speak, and also the increased penetration of renewable energy, wind and solar, which are based on inverter-based technology. Power system engineers are very familiar, like over for many, many years, we used RMS type studies, RMS based studies, to analyze the dynamic behavior of the system. Even to date, RMS studies are very, very important and majority of your power system planning related uh, analysis takes place on RMS type platforms. But EMT is also becoming necessary to analyze the dynamic behavior of the system. And there are so many questions, like we are so many questions that we get asked what is the difference between EMT and RMS type simulations? When you are just trying to uh, analyze the RMS, RMS behavior of the voltage, the uh, oscillations of power and so on. Like we are essentially looking at the same responses, but using two different types of simulations. So there are, there are questions as to what the difference is. So we thought that it would be a good idea to start off by discussing some fundamental aspects of electromagnetic transients simulations and also the differences between EMT and RMS type simulations. So here is the here are the list of topics that we would discuss today. So over the next hour this presentation will try to cover the key differences between electromagnetic transients and RMS type simulations. I will, I will discuss, I will highlight key characteristics of, a electromagnet, of an electromagnetic transient, right? What causes electromagnetic transients, general characteristics, what causes damping of the transient and so on. Things that I think are important for everyone to have a basic understanding when you perform EMT type studies. Then in order to have a general idea about EMT background, I will show you the formulation of equations for EMT type analysis. There are two methods that can be used, or there are many methods, but two popular methods. The one, the direct state space formulation, direct forming formulation of equations and solving them. And then number two, the method proposed by Herman W. Dommel, which is adopted by PSCAD 
and pretty much every EMT simulation software. So we will talk about the mathematical formulation. Then I will talk about very briefly. I will talk about some fee, some uh, mathematical tricks or features that we use to make the accurate uh, solution accurate, fast, and reliable. So I won't go too much into these details. Very briefly, I will discuss some important points. Then also there are some some uh, important points that you may want to remember when you do EMT studies, when you do SSR studies or wind farm studies or lightning studies. There are things that you, there are fundamental things that you may want to remember. I will briefly touch on them and then we will finish this uh, presentation by me demonstrating a number of PSCAD simulation examples. Common applications of electromagnetic transient simulations like the first set here are what we call typical insulation coordination switching type studies like we are here we are looking primarily we are looking at high frequency fast transients and for most year most uh, for until very recently, EMT type programs were predominantly used to study fast transients. Things are changing now. Over the last five years, we are seeing a very uh, wide applications of EMT simulations to study not just fast transients, but general slow dynamics in the system, especially when you try to connect uh, power electronic based uh, generation, wind and solar. Then if you want to study anything that is not 50 hertz, any transients that's significantly different from 50 hertz, then you have to go into EMT type simulations. So for certain harmonic analysis, power quality, it is common for people to use EMT simulations. Another application is subsynchronous resonance. We have a specific topic, so webinar on this topic, so I won't go into details on these. I will just show you some examples. This is just a screenshot of PSCAD EMT DC. Well, obviously I work for, the, for Manitoba Hydro International. In Manitoba, we develop PSCAD EMT DC. So it is natural that I have to show you this screenshot. It's a great uh, tool, very reliable, well established. I hope all of you will one day use it. That's all the marketing I will do during this presentation. Let us try to understand some basics. Now here I'm showing a simple example of a, of a capacitor bank and one of the legs of the capacitor bank is being switched. So when you switch a capacitor bank, you go from you are in steady state. The voltages and currents are in steady state. Once you switch, you will see that the system will go through some transients, fast transients, and settle to a new steady state. Right? What an EMT program does, electromagnetic transient simulation program does, is essentially solve circuit equations to uh, give you the time domain response of this circuit, the time domain response, the instantaneous response, so to speak. In an EMT program, you can still, as you can see in the third plot here, you can also uh, derive, you can also derive the RMS voltage in addition to the uh, time domain instant, instantaneous waveform. However, in EMT programs, the equations are not, equations just calculate the time domain waveform. RMS quantities in PSCAD or any EMT program are just derived from the time domain waveform. They're not calculated directly by solving equations. Whereas in a RMS type program, there is no concept of 
instantaneous time domain, the equations themselves, equations that describe the circuit are de themselves written in, in a way that you calculate just the RMS quantities. So that's one of the differences, so to speak. In recent times, like especially in countries like Australia, USA, UK, there has been a direction to compare models, compare the response of EMT and RM, RMS type simulation results to validate models because you, for system planning, system operation, you have to do PS, uh, EMT studies as well as RMS studies. So when utilities and system operators obtain models from vendors, they do benchmarking by comparing PSSC or EMT and RMS type simulations. So I have shown some examples. The first example, please focus only on the red and dark blue curves. The other curves are just the error envelopes, just ignore them. You can see the plots to the left show a comparison of results from a wind, wind farm fault right through simulation. We are looking at RMS type quantities in this uh, comparison. So we are comparing the voltage recovery characteristics both from RMS type and EMT type. So the red is EMT, blue is RMS, and you can see for all practical purposes, you can say the results are very comparable between RMS and EMT for this particular uh, case for these particular observations of RMS voltage, power, reactive power. But on the wind farm simulation, you will also note that the RMS predicts the voltage to recover a little bit faster, a little bit sharper than EMT, right? So in most cases, when you if you compare P, uh, RMS and EMT, you will see these type of differences and there is a reason for this like in rms type simulations mathematical formulations you ignore certain characteristics certain aspects of the power system or the electric network and because of that you lose some some response characteristics and in this case maybe it doesn't really matter they are very comparable but please note this then the second graph is a comparison of our traditional synchronous generate, generate a fault right to response. Here you can see the RMS quantities, voltage, then the power and reactive power, they match almost perfectly, right? So in general, in most cases, especially when you are adding generation, we are talking, when, especially when you are talking about strong power systems, not weak grids, RMS to PS uh, EMT comparisons generally come out really well or close, and they should. Later on, I will also show you where you just cannot get close matches or where there are differences. Next, I will take an example of a typical electromagnetic transient, just to understand what an electromagnetic transient is. So in this example, all I'm doing is I'm taking a simple circuit of a simple LRC circuit, inductive capacitor, you see an inductor capacitor and there is some resistance in the circuit as well. So all I'm doing here is I'm closing this breaker I'm closing one of the breakers to connect the second leg of a capacitor bank with the first leg already connected. So what happens is if you look at the voltages and currents, they go from voltage would go from one steady state to another. The current initially, of course, is zero. Current through the second leg is zero. So current goes from one steady state to another balanced sinusoidal set steady state after about, at about 2.5 seconds in my simulation, it's achieving, it's 
coming into the steady state. But in between, it has gone through what I call is a is an electromagnetic transient period. So what you see, the oscillations you see here is what I call is a very traditional, like a, it's the traditional electromagnetic transient. It is an electromagnetic transient because only L, R, and C are involved here. There's, there are no rotating machines. There's no saturate nonlinearities such as transformer saturation, nothing. Just simple LRC circuit. And when you disturb this circuit, when you disturb any circuit, that circuit will go through an electromagnetic transient. In this case, the transient is oscillatory in nature. Okay. The transient is oscillatory in nature. And the transient get electromagnetic transient gets damped out pretty fast. Okay. And these are these are typical typical characteristic of an electromagnetic transient oscillatory in nature and there's some damping inherent damping in the system that they don't last for a long time which is really a good thing otherwise it will be very difficult to uh, design insulation and equipment and surge resistors so talking about electromagnetic transients it is the response of L, R, and C in your network. The L and C, L inductors and capacitors are energy storing elements. When you disturb an LC circuit, they try to come, go from their initial steady state to the next equilibrium state. And in doing so, they exchange energy between themselves. That is what you see as voltage and current oscillations. What you have to remember is, in order for you to see an oscillatory transient, oscillatory type electromagnetic transients, you must have both L and C. If you only have L or C, then you will get some other type of transients, but not oscillatory in nature. In most of most studies, most fast transient studies, you would be looking at oscillatory transients. And sometimes it would not be obvious where your L or C may come from. Sometimes the C, the capacitance would come from the, from stray capacitances or bushing capacitances or bus bar capacitances, which you normally ignore in most other studies. So what I'm saying is, it's important to understand the contributing factors for transients and make sure that you represent them adequately in your study. So in this particular case, in this particular case, it's pretty simple. There are only two L's and two C's in this circuit. For this particular case, you can hand calculate the frequency of this oscillation. You can verify that the frequency of this oscillation is given by this equation. L's and C's contribute to the oscillatory nature and the oscillating frequencies. The damping is always because of resistance in your circuit, right? Because it's the resistance that sucks out energy in the form of heat. So in this case, the resistance probably comes from the losses of the inductor, the bus bar losses, and so on. So the resistance could come in the form of losses but mostly the damping and the resistance come in the form of loads. Real loads are resistive and the resistances load loads contribute to the damping of power system transients. Now, if you are interested in studying this, analyzing capacitor switching this particular situation, you actually have to, if you are interested in analyzing this transient period, you actually have to calculate every point of the waveform, point at a point at a point at a time by solving the circuit equations, which I will show you in a little, little while, little bit. So if you are interested in the transient, you do have to solve the equations in the time domain. 
Whereas if you are just interested in the steady state, not the transient, the RMS quantity steady state, you just can define the steady state by two quantities, the magnitude and the phase angle of the voltage and the current. So if you are interested in the steady state, you don't have to do too many calculations. Maybe you can do the calculation one time, just estimate the magnitude and the phase angle, and then you know everything about the steady state of this circuit. What I'm trying to say here is, you have to spend more computational effort, more time when you are dealing with electromagnetic transients. Let's move on. Oh. <clears throat> so here in this capacitor switching example, the transient is due to a number of lumped circuit elements, lumped circuit elements, uh, and the oscillation between those circuit elements in this local area. Like this transient is lim very, very much limited to this, uh, very much limited to the area near this breaker. The fast transients, they don't necessarily penetrate deep into the network. Here you have a transient because of local oscillations of lump LRC elements. Another situation is where you have transmission lines, right? Here in this example, I'm switching this transmission line over here. I have modeled the transmission as a traveling wave frequency dependent line with its design characteristics, design data, and so on. Now transmission line, even though in RMS studies, we modeled the transmission, transmission line as a pi model, right? with RL, lumped RLC elements, it really is not a lumped circuit element. It's a distributed uh, parameter type model where traveling waves can, traveling waves do occur. Because of the uh, transmission lines have an inherent delay associated with it. What I mean is, you, if you apply a voltage step or a transient or of some a change at one end of the line, it will take a while for that, the effect of that change to appear at the other end of the line. So in this example, what I'm trying to show is, I have closed this breaker to energize the line. It's about 290 kilometers. I made it a long line to show the effect. If you analyze the, if you analyze the data of the, if you analyze the design of this line, <coughs> PSCAD will calculate this. The travel time, the delay of this line is about one millisecond. Now, when I do the actual transient, and if I, if I look at the voltage waveforms at the closing end and the remote end, you can clearly see that delay, see? one millisecond delay. So it's the traveling waves that goes back and forth, which builds up the voltage, especially at the open end of the line and cause over voltages. So we talked about transients, electromagnetic transients due to uh, local oscillations of lumped elements. And here's an example of a, a transient uh, dominated due by traveling wave nature of a line. Now, so those are some general characteristics. Let us look at some math. The difference between EMT and RMS type solutions can be best explained. I think it's in a very simple sense can be explained by this simple LR circuit. The equation for this circuit is you can assume a linear inductor. If you assume a linear inductor, the equation for this circuit would be V equals IR plus LDI by DT. So in, a, in EMT programs, we solve differential equations. The circuit equations are solved without approximations. You can see this is a time domain equation frequency or omega is not a, it doesn't come into the picture in this equation, right? Whereas 
So we are not solving this equation considering 50 hertz or 60 hertz or any frequency. It's a time domain equation solution. Whereas in RM, RMS type programs, <coughs> like where you are interested only in the 50 hertz or 60 hertz type variation, uh, 50 hertz or 60 hertz, you represent, you simplify this equation, differential equation to an algebraic equation of this nature. So the differential equation which describes the circuit is simplified or converted or whatever you may call it to an algebraic equation V equals the well-known phase equation IR plus JX times I. X is L omega, omega is 2 pi into 50 or 60. So right away, you are limiting your solution to 50 hertz or 60 hertz, right? But one other important thing, other than limiting the solution to 50 hertz, you will note that the differential equation of the system is now represented by algebraic equations. So you can say in RMS formulation, you ignore the dynamics of the electric networks. In RMS programs, you still consider the dynamic response of machines and uh, wind farms and machines. You still consider the dynamics of machines, but the, trans, the dynamic characteristics of the network itself is ignored. So this sometimes has an impact on your results and observations, especially when you are dealing with weak grades, renewable integration and so on. So let us move on. I don't think I have to go through this. Let us move on and look at a little bit more math. Again, I'm taking a simple case. V, it, it's a LR circuit for the ease of explanation. The circuit, the equation for this circuit is V equals L di by dt plus IR. V and I are time domain not faces, even though I use capital uppercase letters, like these are time domain e equations. So this is the equation we have to solve in order to get the response of this LR circuit. And in EMP programs, like where you may have very complex circuit with nonlinearities, hundreds of you know, nodes and hundreds of equations, it's impossible almost, it's impossible to get an explicit solution. So you always use numerical techniques to uh, solve the circuit. So I don't want to go into details, but using what we call is an integration time step and applying in this case, the so-called trapezoidal rule for integration, I can convert this time domain equation to the numerical form, right? In this case, V naught, V0, I0 represent the voltages and currents that flowed or that occurred in the circuit at the previ previous time step. The so-called, you can even call them initial conditions compared to the present time instant, right? So we assume that we know what happened in the circuit in the past. What happened in the circuit in the past is known which means V0 and I0 are known. If you, if you assume that you know the past, then you can solve for I or V. If you assume that you know V, right? If, you are, if the input to the circuit is the voltage, you can solve for current, right? So this is the formulation of the EMT solution, whereas if it is, if you are interested in the RMS solution, this simply becomes V equals JXI plus RI, you can solve it just one time, whereas the EMT solution must be solved, as you can see, point at a point at a point at a time, which with each point calculated with the time being incremented by the so-called calculation time step delta T, okay? And now you can see 
if you increase or decrease your time step, the calculation time step, it will impact the results because your current solution in this equation, delta t is a way is a factor. So time step will have some impact on the results and you need to keep it small enough. In general, you have to keep it small enough to get an accurate solution. So the point here is the EMT solution, we use numerical methods and the solution is obtained point at a point at a point at a time. At each instant, we increase the time step by delta t for the next calculation. So when you do that, when you do the EMT solution, unlike the RMS solution, you can, your network, your results would be as close as you can get to real life. For example, this is an example from a wind farm, offshore wind farm fault recovery, right? When you clear the fault, the voltages and currents would go through transients, which may have, you know, DC offsets, harmonics, and so on. All of them will be captured accurately if you represent your circuit with the proper differential equations. Obviously, RMS solutions will not be able to capture these type of very uh, harmonics and transients. Then you can now, in the context of uh, renewable generation, power electronics, we also say that. Uh, with the EMT solution, because we are not making mathematical approximations, or we are not making that many mathematical approximations, we say that fast controls of inverters can be better represented, right? And remember, note that I'm, all I'm saying is can be better represented, because they can be represented in RMS programs as well. Then interaction be between fast acting power electronic devices can be studied in RMS uh, EMT programs, sometimes interaction between fast acting power electronic devices, two wind farms close to each other, probably cannot be captured with RMS, especially if those interactions are occurring at frequencies uh, away from 50 or 60 Hertz, because RMS, you are limiting your network mostly to 50 or 60 Hertz. There are a few other simple but important points that I want to highlight. Let us take this simple example of a RC circuit, capacitor, switching a capacitor with a battery, DC battery. Right? If you solve the differential equations, if you do a EMT analysis of this circuit, the capacitor will charge up as shown in the red curve. That is the dynamic of this capacitive network. Right, there's it, it takes time to charge the capacitor. Right, putting this into the power system context, when you are recovering from a fault, the voltage build up. When you build up the voltage after after clearing the fault, of course, there'll be a the voltage build up will be affected by your reactive power supply, but also you need to charge the cable and line capacitance. Charging the cable and line capacitance is the network dynamic that we have, that we talked about. In RMS program formulation, that part of voltage build up, the charging of the capacitor is ignored. That's why when I first showed you some examples, in this fault recovery situation where I compared RMS and EMT, RMS showed that the voltage recovered very fast. That's because we are ignoring the network dynamics. It's assuming that the lines and cables can be charged almost instantaneously. Whereas EMT will always show a delayed start, which is more in line with reality, because in addition to the reactive power requirements, the network dynamics are also captured. So in this case, I probably took a situation where the, the where the difference is pretty prominent and maybe even dramatic, but in general, you will see a slower recovery of voltage uh, when you do it when you do the study in a ELT program. 
and now you know why it's the network dynamics one other point is in a capacitive circuit let us say i have this series compensated line like connecting a wind farm right if i have a fault on one of the series compensated lines and i trip that line right i have a fault i trip this line generally not generally always you trip or you clear the fault at a current zero at a current zero your voltage because of the 90 degree phase shift your voltage is at a maximum right in an inductive or capacitive circuit which means you will you can analyze this for your think of, about this for yourself later when i clear the fault this capacitor on the healthy line would be charged to its peak which means when i clear the fault and this wind farm tries to recover the bus voltage here would have a dc offset as shown in this diagram this is real this is reality i'm not making up things simple circuit uh, explanation but this is reality when you clear faults near series compensated lines you have the risk of having a dc offset on your voltage right this dc offset will decay due to losses in the system and loads in the system in this case that i am showing you there were hardly any loads near near this wind farm so it is still decaying this blue the offset will still decay but at a much at a slower rate the power electronics of the wind farm inverter see this offset and inverters are not designed to handle uh, dc offsets like or elevated voltages the controls the igbts will not work as intended and they will the inverter will trip so these type of this offset obviously is coming because of the network dynamics which you can't capture in rms program on the same token if you switch an inductive circuit like a fault on a power system the current with a capacitive circuit it's the voltage that had a had the offset with an inductive circuit it's very common knowledge fault currents they always have a uh, offset decaying offset in the current this this is again coming because of the network dynamics that you don't capture in an rms program simple things but these can have a huge impact on you know inverters uh, protection and so on so if you want to capture all these then obviously you have to go to emt uh, type simulations like uh, we are not even talking complex controls or complex power electronics we are sim talking simple circuit response one other example like this is a comparison of like this is the resp fault response of a traditional synchronous machine and here in this second curve here i'm comparing rms and emt response of the field field voltage and you can see field voltage both rms and emt are giving comparable results if you compare power reactive power maybe even speed and rms voltage the results will be can will be pretty comparable but look at the fault current look at the fault current right in this case i have cleared the fault after about 150 milliseconds i have zoomed into the fault current here and you will note that of course it's a decaying sinusoid type fault current you can note that the fault current does not have a zero crossing for a number of cycles see breakers clear faults when the current crosses a zero so 
depending on where your breaker is, you will you may not be the breaker will have a hard time clearing this fault for a number of cycles, right up to this point. So that's a real life problem, right, which you have to take care of. But if you try to do a RMS and EMT comparison, right, and you ask the breaker in EMT to clear the fault at this point, breaker will not in, in EMT, the breaker will not clear the fault here. It will wait until it sees a current zero somewhere here. Okay. Whereas on the RMS, there's no concept of you know zero crossings or whatever. The RMS will assume that the fault got cleared here, and you will see like the, when you compare the results between RMS and EMT, you will see differences and you will scratch your head, right? Uh, unless you knew this and you looked at if the breaker in EMT actually cleared the fault when you asked it to clear because the breaker will actually wait until the zero crossing. Simple things that uh, I wanted to highlight for you because I have gotten many, many questions from our users, right? on these type of simple uh, items. Now let us very briefly look at how, like we, we already have an idea that differential equations are solved and so on, but let us look at how system, uh, how equations are solved in an EMT program when you are dealing with large systems, not just a large circuit. Like, like I said earlier, in a EMT program, what it does is solve the differential equations pertaining to a particular circuit. So in a program like PSCAT, what you do is you draw the circuit. You draw the circuit and enter values of your, uh, enter the pa parameters of your L's and C's and transformers in, in the form of data. So you draw the circuit and enter data, PSCAT, will interpret your circuit and form the equations. That's the role of PSCAD, the graphical user interface. It will interpret your circuit and form the equations and maybe write it in a, a matrix form. Write it in a matrix form. So PSCAD, like it, it is user-friendly, it gives you the freedom to draw your circuit as opposed to writing equations, but it does a lot more. It has a critical job because it has to interpret the complex drawing that you may draw, crisscrossing wires and so on, and form these equations accurately. It can't mess things up, right? So in this case, maybe you can go home and try, uh, try this out if you're interested. I've just written the four equations that describes the circuit. So there is one inductor, and one capacitor here. And if you remember, current through an inductor and voltage across a capacitor are what we call state variables, right? Current through a resistor can change, current through a resistor can change instantaneously and the voltage. So current through a resistor is not a state variable. So in this case, I'm trying to formulate the equation in terms of inductor current and the capacitor voltage. And if I rearrange this circuit, I can show that I can write it in this form. General, this is called the state space form where you have the d by dt of the state variables, x dot, or d, in this case, d by dt of v2, the capacitor voltage, and d by dt of i1, the inductor current, related by your system matrix, minus one over r, r to c, one over c, and so on, multiplied by the state variables v2 and i1, plus this term. So this is the state equation for a circuit, and even for a much larger complex circuit, you can write a set of write the matrix matrix equation in this form apply a suitable numerical method and solve the equation and you will get the circuit response with its dynamics this is one way of solving the equations 
right? It's a very straightforward method. You just solve the differential equations. But this is not how we do things in PSCAD. We adopt a different approach. We still have to solve differential equations. We adopt a different approach, which gives you more flexibility to study large networks, program it efficiently in computers, and gives more flexibility for developers like us. And this method was, we, we used the method proposed by Dr. Herman W. Domel. Like, for me, I think it's uh, one of the greatest uh, inventions, if you can call it, in power systems. It has given rise to uh, techniques where we can analyze large, complex systems in an efficient manner. This was proposed about 40 years ago by Dr. Herman W. Domel. Uh, who is still very active and works at the University of British Columbia. So what he said was, okay, he said many more complex things and had done great work over the years as well. But the beauty of it is he showed that any circuit element in the power system may be an inductor, capacitor, transmission line, a rotating machine, transformer, whatever can be represented by a resistor and a current source or a set of resistors and set of current sources this is what he said so it's easy to show that uh, let, let us take an example of an inductor to see what this means so i'm not going to spend a lot of time you can take a look at this yourselves v is equal to l di by dt that is the fundamental equation that we have to solve there's no way around it. You can write this equation and say that the current is equal to one over L integral of VDT over the time period. So just a rearranging of this equation. Then all I have done is apply a numerical technique, in this case, the trapezoidal rule to solve this uh, integral. So when I, re when I do that and rearrange my terms, I can show that the current, which is what I'm trying to solve for this time step, the current I is, a, is the addition of this past term, this current and voltage terms from the past, right? That I should know, it is the history. Right, the history term, this current plus a voltage times a constant. Right? Voltage and currents are V equals IR. This term right, represent V equals IR type situation. Right? So this delta T over 2L or 2L over delta T is that equivalent resistance. Delta T over 2L is the equivalent conductance GL. The current, the equivalent current, which in this case uh, is determined by what happened happened in the circuit in the past or the history term is given by this equation. So you can simply represent the inductor by a resistor and a current source. You can show that this applies to capacitors. You can write the equations and show that the capacitor can be represented by a resistor and a current source. You take a more complex element like a transformer where the equations for V1, the two windings are V1 equals L1 Di1 by dt plus the mutual inductance M Di2 by dt and similar for winding two. You can apply the trapezoidal rule to this equation and show that the mutually coupled or magnetically coupled windings can be represented by a network of resistors and current sources of this uh, topology so in other words any circuit if you have this circuit with inductors and capacitors using domel's approach we can represent it with just current sources and resistors right so the differential equations 
are solved on an individual element basis, right? The V equals L di by dt, the capacitor equation, the transform equation, they can be solved on an individual basis and we can obtain a resistive network to represent my real network, right? As you can see here, like this inductor L1 is represented by a current source and the corresponding resistor. And this corresponding equivalent resistor is a constant because that resistance value is given by 2L over delta T. L is a constant means that equivalent resistance is also a constant. So now we can just relate the node voltages and current injections by an algebraic equation of this nature, right? Why the uh, matrix Y, the admittance matrix Y just consists of resistive terms, okay? Still, we are solving differential equations because to obtain the history current term, you still have to solve differential equations on an individual basis. So with domain's representation, finally, for the network, we are solving an equation, an algebraic equation of this nature. Okay, so I don't want to go into too many details. For this particular example, we can show that this we can show that the system equation is this but in order to solve for voltages you can see this y matrix has to, has to be inverted that's where you take computational time right so as long as these g1 g2 gl1 as long as these elements are constants you don't have to invert this matrix at every time step you can invert it one time if nothing is changing in the matrix you can invert it at one at time zero and just use it but if the elements do change like when you close a breaker or like when igbts and inverter switches change their on off status right at every switching instant then you have to recalculate this matrix and that takes time so <clears throat> When you reinvert this matrix, there are so many multiplications, additions, multiplications, and so on. And you have to do it in an efficient manner. So over the 25 years in PSCAD, we have invested so much effort on making the program as efficient and as fast as possible. One thing that we take into account and most other programs too, is the fact that there are so many zeros in this uh matrix we call the matrix is sparse right rather than trying to do multiplications we identify the fact that there are many zeros we don't have to store all these zero elements in the memory <clears throat> if there are zeros we don't we can ignore certain multiplication steps so taking those type of things into consideration you can make the solution fast but those are details of the program so I don't again want to go into too many, too much detail on that. EMT, like going back to PSCAD, our program structure looks like this. It has three distinct uh, areas. One is called DS Dyne, and then the next one is the network solution. Network solution is where we solve the I equals YV matrix that I showed. DS Dyne is where we solve the transformer models, the inductors, capacitors, and determine for this time step what that history current source value should be. And maybe even this, if this value is changing, inductor, the resistance is changing. For individual elements, we solve the individual elements differential equations and determine what values should go into this Y matrix and the current matrix. So we calculate the elements of the Y and I matrix here and then form the Y matrix and solve it at this point under network solution. 
So at this point, you will have the currents and voltages, the time domain, instantaneous currents and voltages of your circuit. At TS out, if you can do post processing essentially, if you want to calculate the RMS voltage, we can, you take, if you want to calculate the harmonics using a FFT, fast Fourier transform, tra transform block, that's where you do it. So this is the flow of our EMT program. Finally, I will just give you some key points that you may want to remember. Um, this is probably not that important to you, but I will tell it anyways. When you have systems, when you have transmission lines in the system as shown here, we said that transmission lines have an inherent propagation delay. What happens at this, at one end, right, does not impact the response of the other end until uh, until uh, that change at one end propagates to the other end, right? So if that propagation time is greater than your calculation time step delta t, you can tell that transmission line mathematically decouples the two sides a and b in this case, right? So what that allows you to do is solve, of course, considering that there is a transmission line which affects a and b with a propagate after the propagation delay time with respect in that fact we can solve a and b circuits a and b separately independently what that means is rather than solving the matrix of a very large system you can consider the system to be made up of smaller subsystems when you have a when these subsystems are connected by transmission lines. So we use this fact to speed up the simulation. There, you can place circuit A, circuit B, circuit C, and so on in different cores of your computer using a feature called parallel network processing and significantly speed up the simulation. So this is related to simulation speed up. In terms of power system, like in terms of concepts, when you do EMT studies, it is in most cases, you have to do sensitivity analysis, right? Running a fault or running a simulation of break opening or especially break closing once may not capture the worst case. That is because the results are sensitive to a number of factors, right? One of them, one common, one common point that you have to remember is the results, the currents and voltages in most cases are sensitive to when you actually apply the disturbance. In this case, the point on wave of closing the breaker, the blue is your voltage, red is the current, and I'm showing two specific in cases. In case one, the, I assume the breaker is closed at a voltage peak. In case two, I assume the volt breaker is closed at a current crossing on the voltage waveform, right? In both cases, the current, which is shown in red, is sinusoidal, peak to peak. Peak to peak values in both cases would be identical, but you can see in case one, the current is symmetrical around the axis, x-axis, time axis, whereas in the other case where I close the breaker at a voltage zero crossing, the current is completely, it has a 100% offset, DC offset, right? So obviously in this example the dc offset keeps going on and on and on that is because i don't i didn't assume any resistance if you have resistance and losses in the circuit the dc offset will eventually decay but you can see from this exercise simple illustration the point on wave impact and its importance in pss ps uh, emt type studies i was also going to uh, touch base on 
the impact of network characteristics, the resonance point of your network, and the resonant points or the net characteristics of your network on the transient response. But I think because of because we are running out of time, I'm going to leave that for another day because when I talk about SSR, SSTI, and renewable integration, we can uh, I will highlight the relationship between network characteristics and uh, the transient response. So with that, that is the end of my presentation on the basic concepts. Hopefully this is useful. Hopefully when you see, when you do studies and when you have to compare results, some of these information will come in useful. I will stop my presentation now and for those of you who can stay on i will quickly demonstrate some very typical pscad based examples of uh, electromagnetic transient simulation studies uh, covering a number of topics topics i may not be able to show you all because we have run out of time but uh, most of these would be available to you uh, within the next few days to download and run yourself. Okay, so I'm sorry I went over the one hour limit. I will just take 10 more minutes to show you a few cases. First example, maybe I'll try to run it here, is a simple capacitor switching example, right? There are four capacitor banks. They are all three phase banks, four three phase capacitor banks. One of them, one of the banks is energized and I'm trying to energize the second bank. When I do that, we know we <coughs> initiate what we call our inrush current transients. You can see very high frequency currents that would flow in the local loops of the capacitor bank. Right? These are very high frequency transients. And one thing you can remember is faster the transients, they are more localized in nature. These very fast transients, like when you close the breaker here, the very fast transients, their effect, you won't feel two or three substations away. So when we are studying these type of transients, it's pretty common to model only a small part of the system as opposed to modeling the entire, like five, six, 10 buses. In this case, I have, this is just an illustration. I have modeled the rest of the system by a seven inch impedance, seven inch voltage source. This is also not good. You probably should model at least details at least one or two buses away, maybe one bus away. This is an example of switch the transmission line switching. So what I'm doing here is Close in this break at station A to observe the O voltages appearing at station B, station A, station B, and also the bottom graphs, the surgerist energy dissipation. Because in a line switching study or a switching study, one thing you are looking at is would my surgerist be able to limit the O voltage, which it will do, but if the O voltage is not well damped, there is a risk that the arrestor would have to absorb absorb more energy than it is capable of and maybe eventually fail. And I have set this case up using PSCAD's multiple run component. What I'm doing here is I'm running a parametric study. I'm changing the point on wave to capture the worst case. Third example I'm going to show you is of is an example of transient recovery voltage. Once again, let's not spend a lot of time because there is one webinar on this topic where we will go into details of TRV. TRV, transient recovery voltage, is the voltage that appear across the circuit breaker when you interrupt the current or when you open the current. Again, TRV is a pretty fast phenomena. The effects are pretty Look, 
the TRV is influenced by the circuit elements around the breaker. So I'm performing the TRV study on this uh, station that is modeled in the, inside this yellow box. I have the system model as well, but the system model does not have a big impact on the TRV. So I have for TRV or very fast studies, I have to model the substation in more detail than you would do for a dynamic response study like a wind farm fault recovery. So here I have modeled the natural capacitance, bushing capacitance of transformers, bus bar sections, and so on to capture the accurate response, TRV response. I have already run the case in PSCAD. You can compare the TRV waveform. See the waveform is here with the capability envelope of the breaker. So the other curves here are the capabilities of the breaker. In this case, you can see the TRV is violating or exceeding the capability of the breaker. So we have to find solutions. Like it's a voltage, TRV is a voltage. When your voltage rate of rise is high, you can always limit it, try to limit it by your capacitor. In this example, we will show you at the next presentation. If you add this very small surge suppressing capacitance, you will bring this TRV, the waveform, inside the envelope. Uh, I have one more. I have some other examples on lightning, ferroresonance, which we will. Uh, which we will uh, add to what you can download over the next few days. I can show you the results of the ferroresonance example. This is because of transformer saturations and transformers, transformer saturation, which is an inductive phenomena and its interaction with any capacitance in the substation. LC resonance would cause these type of uh, sustained poor voltages that can damage your equipment. Here is an example of a slower transient wind farm fault recovery. So in this case, what I'm trying to study is would this wind farm be able to recover from a fault on the system, in the system? And initially, when we did the study, when we, if you run this example and apply this fault, wind farm will actually <clears throat> not recover, it will trip. So, what I have done here is in order to find a mitigation option, a solution, I have added a synchronous condenser here. Right? So, synchronous condenser provides uh, system strength, so so to speak, or it provides fault current and strengthens that area of the system. And with the appropriately sized synchronous machine, synchronous general condenser, the wind farm can ride through. So in a study like this, the idea would be to find the smallest rating of the synchronous condenser that would make the wind farm meet compliance grid code requirements. So, okay. Here's a simple example of transform energizing. You can see when I close this breaker, you can see the transform in rush currents, right? Typically, when you energize transformers, the in rush current can be a number of, could be four, three, four, five times the rated current of the transformer. As a result, when you draw that current, there could be voltage drops in the system. So that's one thing you would be looking at. But also, like depending on the nature of the circuit, depending on the res uh, resonant, char resonant characteristics, the impedance characteristics of the circuit, energizing transformers can also cause harmonic voltage distortions and voltage escalations like this. 
right so again in a different seminar we will discuss the technical details mathematical details of this type of phenomena this is a more realistic transform energizing study that Here, this study was from was to support the design of a new solar farm. Before you connect solar, you have to energize solar inverters and so on. You have to energize the transformer. So the question here was, when you energize this transformer at this new location, would it cause voltage drops at other substations nearby? where there are other solar farms. Because if energizing the transformer causes voltage drops at other locations, and if these voltage drops last for a, last for a certain amount of time, the other protection of the other solar farms will get activated and they might trip. So you can't allow that. You have to tell the new solar farm owner to find mitigation options so that the other equipment other customers in the vicinity are not impacted this is an example uh, from a black start restoration study utilities transmission operators they have a well established well tested black start restoration plans in case your system uh, goes into a blackout situation you have to have a plan to restore the system one thing when you restore from a complete blackout or a brownout is you have very little loads right you are trying to energize the loads until you bring loads into the system there are no loads which means there are there is very little damping in the system so when you try to restore systems, sometimes it's very difficult to energize transformers and lines because they're going to, when you energize them, you, you initiate transients and there's not enough damping in the system to you know damp them out. So these must be tested. The, your, you first derive a plan, you write it down on paper, but you have to do RMS and EMT studies to verify that you can actually implement the plan without you know causing equipment damage causing unnecessary unintentional un relay trippings and so on so this is an example here you can see i'm starting from a generating station where i have modeled the synchronous machine the exciters governors and their appropriate control modes and from starting from there i'm studying the energizing of the generator transformer the energizing of the main station transformer then energizing of long lines that's going out from this transformer and then finally maybe even energizing of load blocks from stations far away and finally i also have an example of the subsynchronous sub torsional interactions because of time and because we have a separate webinar on this topic, I'm not going to go into details of this. Like I like we said before, we will provide all this material to you for your review. Uh, with that, I think we will uh, end this presentation. I hope uh, you got something out of it and hope to see you again in two weeks time thank you very much